Aidan, when was the European Union created? If we work backwards, O'Brien, and start with 2009, uh, that was the year when the body known as the European Union merged with another body known as the European Community. And so the merged body took the name European Union. Originally, the Union had been set up in 1993, and at that time it existed alongside the European Community. Uh, in 2009, they came together. And prior to 1993, the year of the Union's creation, the European Community was a much older body, which was established in 1958. Uh, the documents to form it were signed in 1957, and it was predated by a 1951 organisation called the European Coal and Steel Community, so the Union's origins can be traced right back through the European community to the 1951 European Coal and Steel Community. So if that's what it is, what is the European Union now? I suppose the first thing to say is that it's a unique body on the world stage. It certainly was at the time of its creation in the 50s, and to some extent it, it, it still is by and large. Uh, it's got a nice balance of power, a unique balance of power between its own powers and the powers of the members. Uh, the members are states, so there's a collection of almost 30 states who make up the Union. Uh, all of them are members of it, uh, including the UK, and all 28 must uh, abide by its obligations and undertake to complete their duties. Uh, but each state also gets the benefits of whatever entitlements come from membership. Right, so it's a number of states who all get benefits by clubbing together like a big boys club. So what's the aim of the European Union? Well, the initial aim, I suppose, was to achieve peace on the continent. Uh, we had had two world wars which both commenced on European soil in the space of a century. So the initial idea was to try and get the two big players on opposite sides, Germany, West Germany, as it then was, together with France. And uh, that happened. So the aim was peace, I suppose, above all else. And I think it's quite amazing that the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, having only been created in 1949, within 10 years was joining a grouping of countries along with its former enemies who were prepared to join with it. And all of that happened within 10 years of some dreadful events that had gone on prior to 1949. Uh, in addition to peace, the original aim alongside that was to try and have an internal single market which would make free trade and business across the boundaries of all the member states easier. And so that was a big important aspect as well. And by 1968, all internal tariffs between member states of the then community, uh, those tariffs had gone and it made business and trade um, very simple and much more straightforward than before the body was created. So that's a lot of information. So we're talking about um, European world peace and free trade. That was its original aim. But, but what is its aim today? I suppose today the aims have become a bit broader than back then. Uh, it's still, and I think it's important to say that it is still not a, a super state. Uh, the European Union is not that, nor is the European Union a federation in its structure. So, yes, it has indeed got broader aspirations, but it's still not a super state. The broader aspirations that it now has include economic and monetary union, and half of the member states, or more than that, have the euro as their currency. Uh, so they have given up their own national currencies in favour of an EU currency called the euro. And I suppose the last big development is that nowadays, unlike in the 1950s, the European Union and its members, uh, the Union aims to have broader cooperation mm. on political issues so that where possible, it can speak with one voice to the outside world. And it always tries to do that. In recent years, we saw it try to speak with one voice on Libya, for example. And so that's another modern day aim that was perhaps not there back in the 1950s. Right. So that's a lot he's trying to achieve then amongst all these countries, which is about um, speaking with one voice, 
uh, being able to work together in terms of its economic productivity and actually having one kind of currency. Um, so what countries are involved in the European Union? At the moment, today, there are 28 member states. The original six were the Federal Republic of Germany, which was known as West Germany, Italy, France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. In 1957, the relevant treaty was signed. It was signed on behalf of the six heads of state, uh, four men, two women, uh, the heads of state of the six countries at that time and it's now grown over the years since 1957 to a union of 28 member states. Well, wow, that's, that's a lot of information. So that's 28 member states all working together. Uh, but how has that changed um, from then until now? Well, for us, the big development was that we joined in 1973, and uh, we, together with Denmark and Ireland, uh, took the number of states in what was then the European Community uh, to a total of nine. And then in 1981, uh, Greece joined. In 1986, Spain and Portugal joined. In 1995, Austria joined. In 2004, on one day, 10 new member states mm -hmm. joined, uh, mainly countries from the former Eastern Bloc, from the Eastern part of the continent, uh, but also Malta on that day. Uh, in 2007, Romania and Bulgaria became members of the Union. And most recently, in 2013, uh, Croatia became the 28th member. Uh, and it's quite interesting that many of the countries uh, that are now members of this group of 28, making up the Union, many of them were dictatorships in recent decades. Greece, Spain, and Croatia as part of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, so quite a sea change in uh, their structure and the fact that they now are able to be members of this very democratic union. So, and we were talking earlier and we said so that's 28 countries and I think we worked out that's 508 million people. That's almost twice the size by population uh, compared to America. Um, so getting them to work together, what rules actually helps the European Union work? The size of it is a very important feature of the Union. It's a very powerful block uh, on the world stage. As you said, O'Brien, it's 508 million people of a population. It's the third biggest population block on the planet behind China and India. And in terms of rules, the two main rule books, if you like, are what are called treaties. Uh, one of them is known as the Treaty on European Union. Uh, the other one is the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And together they set out the rules. They decide the relationship between the Union and each of the 28 states in it. Uh, and also, very importantly, those two treaties, those two rule books, uh, decide how the relationship between the different institutions of the European Union work. Uh, so institutions like the European Parliament, which is democratically elected by the citizens of Europe, including citizens here, the Commission, an institution that people may have heard of, mm. uh, and other institutions. Uh, finally, I should say that the referee, if you like, is the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which adjudicates on any disputes between either the Union and the member states, or uh, disputes between the Union and its institutions within it. And that's in Luxembourg. It's not the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights is in Strasbourg and is not a European Union institution. Oh. Uh, so the referee for the European Union is the Court of Justice based in Luxembourg. Okay, so 28 countries, 508 million people, only two treaties and uh, a referee which is very important. But, but give me some examples of, um, of how those core principles work. Well, some of the most important principles that the European Union has would include democracy uh, and something called the rule of law. And whatever state out there becomes in the future the 29th member of the European Union, it will have to, as a, a set of preconditions, be able to demonstrate that it has a democratic system such as ours and also be able to demonstrate that just like the United Kingdom, it has a, 
respect for what is called the rule of law, and that includes straightforward familiar concepts like innocent until proven guilty, mm. um, criminal trials in open court rather than behind closed doors, and very many other very important things. Uh, and then in addition to democracy and the rule of law, uh, there are what are called the four freedoms. And these are at the heart of the union because they are important freedoms for the internal single market. So the free movement of persons, the free movement of goods, the free movement of services, and the free movement of capital. And all of those four are really important to give us a, a free trade area, free travel, and free trade in goods across the block of 508 million people in 28 states. So this is more than just then about immigration, uh, and it's more than just about where people live. Um, and there's a lot you've just given, but how does that really impact on us here? It impacts in a fundamental way. There is no getting away from the fact that the European Union is important to all of our lives in, in what is the, one of the member states. We are a member state and this union is important to each and every one of us. Mm. Uh, there is the access to that block of 508 million people. Uh, there is that support for democracy, that sense of solidarity between all of the states in being united in their view of the importance of democracy and the rule of law. And I should point out that it is the case that the freedoms that I mentioned in answer to your previous question, O'Brien, none of those freedoms are absolute. And so, for example, if we take free movement of persons, it impacts on us in the sense of people from here able to move and live in Belgium, Spain, etc., and a flow of people in the opposite direction. But the freedom of travel for citizens of the Union is not absolute. And so, for example, someone with a murder conviction who is a citizen of France, uh, yes, that person with a murder conviction who is a citizen of France is a European Union citizen, but if this state, the UK, is aware of his conviction, then there is the possibility within the rule book of the EU to say to that particular European citizen, you are not entitled to free travel uh, because you pose a threat perhaps to the safety of people here. So none of those four freedoms, the freedoms of movement for persons, goods, services and capital, none of them are absolute. So what you're saying is, member of a club, I've got 508 million friends and we can trade, exchange things, but actually the rules that operate are not guaranteed for me as an individual if I don't comply with those absolutes. Um, but I guess the real core thing is then, what does the future hold for us in the European Union? When you ask that question, O'Brien, at a very interesting point, it's very difficult to give a definitive answer. And the reason I say that is because the future is a bit uncertain, and that's because the Union has, in very quick succession, in the last four or five years, had to grapple with two very big challenges. And it has attempted to do so, imperfectly, uh, but it has attempted to deal with them. And the two big challenges were firstly the economic crisis, the worldwide economic crash. And the EU has attempted to deal with that by, for example, the creation in 2012 of something called the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM. And that's still a very new entity within the Union. Mm -hmm. And so only time will tell how effective it is. Uh, but it's a, a, an attempt to address the economic crisis. Uh, and secondly, uh, we have, of course, in more recent times, in the last two years, had the difficulty posed by the uh, tragedy of the influx of people from Syria and other places south of the Mediterranean. Uh, and again, the European Union is trying, as we speak, to make some efforts to address that situation. Um, a quick example would be that in the last year, it has had one of its agencies uh, take over responsibility for looking at the uh, influx of people in the Mediterranean area and lifting from the countries like Greece who are on the outer border of the Union the responsibility of trying to manage that on their own. So now we have the involvement of an EU body. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot then, um, and that's a lot to say, you know, 
how does all that work? Will it work together well? And indeed, is it productive? But more importantly, why do we want to spread and share our wealth with others? So uh, I guess the big question is, do we stay or do we leave? Well, yes, that is the big question, O'Brien. And in answer to your last question, I said that it's difficult to say with precision what the future holds. Um, but I would advocate a view that the future for the European Union is most probably more positive than negative on balance. If we look at the challenges it has dealt with in the past, if we look at how it's trying to grapple with those two big challenges that came at it in very quick succession in the last five, six years, uh, then I think there is a will and a willingness to succeed. Uh, so I think we should do the optimistic thing in June. We should vote with our, our hearts, uh, not with our heads, and that might be difficult for people to do, but I think that's what should be done on this occasion. And for two reasons, O'Brien. Uh, the first is that uh, Europe, the European Union, and each of its members, whether remaining or leaving, we all face a very big threat in economic terms from the growing power bases of China, India, and other places across the world stage. So the European Union, uh, together, the 28 in that union, can stand up for themselves en masse against China and India, and we could not do that so well alone. And the second reason why we should stay, I think, is that there is the phenomenal threat of terrorist attack, which each of the 28 states faces. The uh, heritage of the continent of Europe is a Christian heritage. Now, of course, today, as a modern continent, it is a much more diverse place, but it has that original Christian heritage, and a tiny minority of people from beyond that religion and from other religions uh, are trying to conduct a terrorist threat against the European Union and its states and its capital cities, and we have seen that. So uh, that is a reality. They are a, an unfortunate, mm, radicalized minority, not representative of their own religion, uh, but uh, they see as a target this continent of ours with its Christian heritage. Now, uh, it may be uncomfortable to face up to that, but it's something we must be open in our discussion about. It uh, doesn't mean we have to be disrespectful to um, practices of diversity and equality. Uh, of course not. This is a very equal and a very diverse continent, mm. and that's part of the rule of law which we talked about earlier. However, the threat is there, and no one can sensibly believe that that terrorist threat can be faced down more easily if we stand alone than if we go together. And so this European Union is very important in keeping us all safe, and that is the reality. So for those two reasons, I think we should not just try to remain in it. We should look at the fact that we, of the 28 states, are amongst the four bigger states. Uh, those four, including us, are the envy of the other 24 smaller states. And why should we walk away from such a power base, from such a position of influence? Uh, my view is, O'Brien, we should not just remain, we should not just stay, we should try to lead this union. It has a proud history. In 2012, it won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the future is uncertain, but where we are in this union, we know where we are. Why should we leave that status quo and take a leap into the unknown, a leap into the dark, and a great gamble with not our futures, but the futures of children and grandchildren of the people of this country? So we should definitely stay in the European Union. You know, you've stolen the march on the old debate, because uh, I thought we were going to get together and, and do that soon. Um, and what you've said is all very valid, but there is always an alternative way to achieve the same end goal. So how about we get together and we have a chat and bring along a few friends and see if we can actually inform and understand each position better and come to an agreement on which is our best way forward. I look forward to that, O'Brien. Look forward to it too. Thank you very much. You too.